welcome to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, and I'll be joined for this episode by co-host Jamie Stillway. For this episode, we caught up with flat-picking superstar Molly Tottle. Uh, Molly has been super busy these past few years, and um, you've probably heard her playing. She's an incredible flat picker. She has done some videos for acoustic guitar uh, where she shows off her cross picking and teaches how to do it. And I love how easy she makes it seem because it's inspiring and it actually kind of makes me think, hey, I might be able to do that someday if I just practice like a lot. She lives in Nashville these days, but Molly is originally from the Bay Area in California and I was lucky enough to see her play at the Stern Grove Festival in San Francisco. And the performance was as amazing as you might expect. It, she just, her and her band, Golden Highway, they have so much fun on stage. And she makes all of this super fast, super concise music just feel and sound so effortless. I hope you enjoy our interview with Molly Tuttle. Before we get into it, I do want to thank everybody who listens and supports this show on patreon if you'd like to support the show you can check us out on patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus or check the show notes for more information we do release bonus episodes just for the patreon community and there's a whole bunch of other great extras there so check it out patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus and without further ado here's our interview with molly tuttle yeah, I'm super curious. I'm full disclosure, a guitar nerd, and I love asking other guitarists, you know, about their practicing habits and routines. And so, yeah, one question I I was with Nick here, I was like, how do you practice on the road? And I get that, like, if especially 23 shows in 24 days, there's not a lot of room for <laughs> introspection and practice. But do you have a specific routine that you like to get into when you're home? Or um, When I'm home, I try to, like, go back to focusing on songwriting mostly um, and then guitar playing kind of working out parts to play in songs that I'm playing live or um, a lot of it is just kind of like working up new songs writing songs and then figuring out a guitar part I used to have like a really specific practice routine where I'd like break it up into three chunks and do like one part of like scales and arpeggios and like fingerboard stuff and one of like improvisational kind of working on different chord progressions that I wasn't comfortable improvising over or like different improvising using different scales. And then one would be like learning new songs or like just learning something for fun. Um, but these days my practice routine is really all over the place. <laughs> but I'm mostly kind of thinking ahead, like what's my next record? I need to write, what songs do I need to write? Um, what guitar parts do I need to work on for my next project? stuff like that. Um, I kind of want to ask about your experience at Berkeley. You had talked about your very regimented practicing schedule of Once Upon a Time, and I wonder if that was informed by your days of studying music. Yeah, definitely. Like, I'm curious, to learn guitar, did you just learn as a kid from your family and playing in your family band? Did you take lessons? Yeah, well, my dad is a music teacher. Um, he teaches private lessons. Whenever I say like my dad's a music teacher, people imagine him like in a school or something, but he always just had this little room at a music store in Palo Alto where I grew up um, and people would just come in for like one-on-one -on -one lessons. It's literally like the most tiny room you could imagine. My dad would teach in there and then he would sometimes teach like group classes and in a different part of the music store where people would come and he had one class that was like bluegrass jam class where you like work up songs together um and then he had one class that was like a kids jam class and that's where I met like a bunch of friends who were my age who played bluegrass and took lessons from my dad and we formed like little bands and stuff but my dad was very since he's a music teacher he's very into practicing so um he was always like you should practice like as many hours as possible and like have a good practice routine um and then when I got well I had a couple other teachers to growing up here and there, like my middle school, the music teacher at my middle school um, was into bluegrass as well, but he kind of also let me like borrow his CD collection, listen to other styles of music and would teach me and my friends like rock songs and stuff. And that was really fun. Um, and I had like a couple other teachers who taught at the same music store as my dad. Sometimes I'd go in and want to like take from someone else. There was like a blues 
guitar teacher and a quad hammer banjo teacher. Um, and then, yeah, when I got to Berkeley, it was like kind of had more of like a practice routine where I was like learning theory and scales and stuff like that, where before that I kind of just learned by ear. I really love the visual of a kid's bluegrass jam. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> just... There were like quite a few kids who took bluegrass. Well, he still has like a bunch of kids students, but um, yeah, it was pretty fun. <laughs> Did um, formalizing the theory and the reading um, of music and everything kind of change your approach at all to playing? I think so. Yeah, it helped me kind of like learn how to apply. Like maybe I knew like a lick in one key. And I always wanted to play that lick, but only in that key. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I understand like those notes I'm playing in the scale. Now I can like play it off the neck or play in a different key or it kind of just opened up the guitar for me a little bit more where before that I felt like I was just kind of maybe learning from other guitar players, try to copy what they did. But um, then learning the theory helped me really understand what what notes I was playing and how to kind of branch out and maybe create some more of my own ideas are there any um can you think of any particular examples maybe in in uh some of your songs that you've written since then um that mm -hmm. you can kind of point to yeah i think like one um tune that i still have been playing live is a tune that i wrote called super moon and that was on my ep rise um so like i wrote that um right after moving to nashville and i feel like that one kind of has like it's in like a kind of more um, like maybe a mixolydian mode or something. I don't really know what mode it's in, but it has more kind of like interesting timing stuff that um, I felt like I was influenced by my classes at Berkeley. Yeah, I remember I took like this class about um, like polyrhythms and stuff and the A part of that tune kind of, it has the same line over and over again, but kind of like displaced. Um, and I feel like maybe some of my classes at Berkeley helped me write that too. I realize this might be an impossible question to answer, but did you ever feel that there, like when you went, made the decision to go to Berkeley, was there ever, a, did you ever think like, maybe I won't go to music school at this juncture in my life. I'll maybe go someplace else. Yeah. Like I wasn't sure I wanted to go to music school. Um, Cause some people I talked to were like, don't go to music school. I'll just like go straight into like making records and like or move to Nashville or move to LA or uh, you don't need music school I don't know it just for some reason really appealed to me I wasn't ready to just like go out on my own I didn't really know anyone in like the music industry at that point I but I had like friends who went to Berkeley and it sounded really fun and I was excited to like just focus on studying music for a couple years and you um you know you you've been in Nashville since I want to say 2015, I read. Is that is that correct? Mm -hmm. How, and I mean, that's, it can be its own music education. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, how has that kind of influenced what you do and how you do it? Yeah, it's, it's really influenced um, what I do because I think just getting to play with so many incredible musicians here and, um, and meet so many amazing, um, amazing people who are just total professionals and, um, I think it's just kind of inspired me to up my game and, and also like the co-writing aspect of it. I found people to write with who I wrote with um, for my last record. And that's really changed the music that I make and how I write songs. Nick and I were talking before uh, he was like, what do you like to listen to? And I was like, I'm really into listening to Lizzo's new album. And I admitted oh, yeah. my pop music affinities. And um, so then I was, we were wondering, is there anything your guilty pleasures of music that you like to listen to? <laughs> Not that Lizzo's a guilty pleasure. Well, actually, I know what my guilty pleasure is. It's turning on like mainstream country radio in the car. Uh. <laughs> I love like bro country. <laughs> I don't actually really, it's like part of me loves it and part of me is like annoyed by it. But I'm like, I feel like the more times I've turned it on, like the more I've grown to love, love it. Weirdly, I never thought I would like it, but. Weirdly for like playing like country adjacent music and living in Nashville for seven years, I feel like I hardly know anything about country music, but I am slowly learning. <laughs> country adjacent. I like that's how you described <laughs> some of your work there. That's, that's just great. Yeah, it's really good. 
So I watched your interview on PBS NewsHour a a couple months ago, and I really related to your story of being, when you talked about being passed over at the Bluegrass Jam. Oh, yeah. (laughs) In my own experience as a guitarist who happens to be a woman, like there is this sort of quiet stuff that goes on that you're not really, it's like, you're Mm -hmm. like, did that just happen? And I feel like that in that story, you sort of were like, oh, that that just happened. And I wonder, as your career has progressed, that's not happening as much, or if sometimes you still feel it going on? Yeah, I don't think that I feel it happening now that like, my career is more established. I'm not just going, usually also like, I'm kind of just playing music with my friends and like surrounding myself with people who are really supportive. I don't usually like go into a random jam with a bunch of people I don't know anymore maybe because I'm like traumatized from that experience but (laughs) it's important to just kind of like surround yourself with good people especially if you're like a woman playing the guitar and like I don't know had some weird experiences especially in bluegrass jams (laughs) yeah it's weird sometimes I'll still get it like when I walk into a guitar store yeah and and a couple of years ago, I was at a small store with my one of my duo partners, and he was trying out guitars, and mm-hmm. I was just like, I wasn't in the mood to do that that day. So I was yeah. just walking around, and the man working at the guitar store said to me, oh, you know, there's a shoe store a couple blocks down. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, that is so well, now that's pretty obvious. That is so annoying. I wanted to ask uh, about what you play a little bit. Um, you You have a signature guitar, yeah? Yes, yeah, there's a Preston Thompson signature multi-tuttle guitar. And what, um, I mean, I, I got to imagine you had quite a bit of say into what went into that. What was like some of the most important parts, some of the first things you said, it's got to have this, this? Well, I think I, I wanted it to be a dreadnought because that's what I play. And um, and like the 11th, 16th neck size is what I'm comfortable with. I made a mistake. Um, I have another guitar from Thompson and didn't know like what neck size I liked and they said like do you want three quarter size and I was like yeah that's like standard right and they were like yeah and I got the guitar and the neck was like felt so big and they replaced it for me which was so nice of them but this time around I was like it definitely has to be 11 16 which is like the slightly smaller neck we decided on mahogany and I like rosewood too but I think I think I go through phases and um, when we were designing it I was really into mahogany guitars I always kind of like gravitate back towards mahogany guitars right now I'm kind of mainly playing my rosewood guitar so it really just depends I don't know I like them both so I can't really choose but I think when we were designing it I was like I like mahogany right now (laughs) they had some like redwood that I knew about that I think they found I don't know it has something to do with like maybe it was in an old train or like part of a train track or something it had to do with trains somehow they got this like old redwood and at first I was like oh I would love like um some redwood like maybe a redwood guitar would be cool I grew up near the redwoods um but they said the wood's so soft that they can't like really make a full guitar but they did like redwood inlay around the sound hole and like little bits of redwood like in the um fret markers uh which was really cool and then they made like a really pretty sunburst and put some special inlay on the guitar as well. How many guitars do you have? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe like, <laughs> I don't have like hundreds, but like somewhere between like 10 and 20 probably. Do you, do you prefer newer, um, more modern guitars over vintage guitars? Um, I like the sound of vintage guitars more, but because I'm like playing on the road so much, I had a vintage guitar and then it just kept like getting messed up, like, cause I would take it to like different altitudes and like different weather. And it was always like cracking and stuff. And I just felt bad that I was kind of ruining this nice old guitar. So then I sold it and now I don't have a single vintage guitar, but, um, I would like to get, get one sometime soon do you have mainly dreadnoughts or do you have guitars say i think you have electric guitars also Mm -hmm. but in the acoustic realm all dreadnoughts or do you have all sizes i have all sizes um yeah i have like a little i think my smallest one is like one of those callings waterloo guitars oh yeah i really like that one when i'm home i play it a lot and then just kind of from that and then my biggest one might be like this um 
guy, Edward Maday, who's a fan of my music and he's an instrument maker, made me this really cool arch top guitar. And that's like bigger than a dreadnought. So that's probably my biggest one. If you say you would be open to a vintage guitar, any idea what what you would be in the market for? I'd probably need to start with like a Martin D18 or D28. And then from there, I'd love like a triple O Martin. And then maybe after that, I would get like an old Gibson. <laughs> yeah, I have a 1921 Gibson L1 that I love to play. And it sounds so great, but it's like so fussy. And there's just, you know, it's like, okay, you stay, you stay in the corner there. <laughs> no sudden movements. I wanted to uh, ask you about your cover of She's a Rainbow, the Stone song. The video is so good. Oh, it's thanks. Very, very inspirational. Well, I kind of gravitated towards that song first because of the um, piano line. And I was like, oh, that sounds really fun to play on guitar. And I was trying to pick songs for my cover album. Um and that one I just felt like I could put a different spin on and then listening to the lyrics, I was like, oh, I don't know what their intent was with the lyrics, but if it's sung, sung by a, whim, a woman, it's kind of like, sounds like a celebration of other women and um, just like the full rainbow. Um, and so I thought I could just kind of lyrically and with the guitar, put my own spin on that song. And that's what I was trying to do with the cover album is to kind of choose songs that might surprise people or, um, or totally recreate a song that make it sound really different from the original. Um, and then, yeah, going from that idea for the video, we just thought it would be cool to um, showcase like different sides of who I am with sometimes I wear a wig, sometimes I don't, and then feature other friends I have for, um, who have alopecia. And then from there, we just kind of branched out to anyone can be in this video if they want to. And so I reached out to a lot of my friends um, and ask them to share their thoughts on feminism and stuff like that. And it was a really fun video to make. It was very rewarding. I read that your the covers album was kind of born of quarantine. Is that was that true? Yeah, the whole record felt like it was something I wanted to do once we were in lockdown. And um, I knew I had wanted to work with Tony Berg, but we kind of we had been actually meeting right when lockdown started. Like I flew home from LA hanging out with Tony who produced the cover album and then all the gigs were canceled. Like I flew back early, I think, cause we were hearing like everything's getting canceled. Um, so we didn't talk for a few weeks. And then when we did, we're like, well, if we could still make a record somehow. Um, so we decided we're gonna make like a quarantine style record um, of just like a bunch of songs that I really liked. And we went through a ton of songs and songs I've covered in the past and kind of came to this group of songs because we both both felt really strong about them. The uh, the Rancid cover that you put on there, the punk band. Mm -hmm. uh, did you listen to like local punk rock growing up? Yeah, I listened to, I mean, yeah, Rancid was like one of my favorites in like middle school, like seventh and eighth grade. I was obsessed with them. I got really into like Operation Ivy, which is like has some members of Rancid, but was like a little earlier. Um, and then of course, Green Day, another Bay Area punk band. Past that, I, it's not like I was in, I don't think I was into any like obscure Bay Area, like punk bands exactly. Um, but I was really into Rancid and I used to play their songs with my friends. And I had one friend who played bass and we would like learn rancid songs. I remember she had like the coolest hoodie that her older sister gave her as a hand-me-down. It had like an Operation Ivy patch on the back, like all safety pinned onto it and like tons of studs on it. And I always like wanted to steal it. I thought it was so awesome. Is there any like correlation? Cause punk rock and bluegrass have a lot of energy, you know, do you find any correlations between those two styles at all? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, the chords are kind of similar, especially like that song I covered, Olympia Washington, it could almost, you could like slow it down and put like a bluegrass rhythm to it. Um, and it has all the same chords that you would find in a bluegrass song. I think like I met Tim Armstrong, who 
writes a lot of the rancid songs and he was saying like he grew up listening to Hank Williams and kind of like writes lyrics kind of like a country singer almost and I definitely hear those same themes like like if you take Olympia it's kind of talking about like hitchhiking wanting to get back um to where you're from or like a, a specific city in that song they're talking about like wanting to leave New York City and get back to Olympia and I feel like that you just could it like exchange those cities for like other like cities in the south or something and it would sound like a country song almost how did you learn of those bands when you were in middle school was it just your friends were listening to the music yeah just my friends I always think about like how how we hear music now it's like you know when I was a kid we still had radio stations and no streaming music and now it's like there's such a wide variety of stuff available to anyone and yeah I remember like in middle school we were still doing like it was in the early 2000s, so we were doing like those seat, like burning CDs for each other. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this got this boy I liked in like sixth grade burned me a CD. I think it had like Green Day, Ranted. It had this band called like Gogol Bordello uh, that was like a yeah. punk band. They're still around, and I ended up going to see them live like so many times as a kid just because. I liked one of the songs that was on like that mix CD. That's a they put um, on a wild show, right? I know. Yeah, it was really fun. We'd always go see them at like the Fox in Oakland, and it, the crowd would get really wild. <laughs> were you were you in the middle of the mosh pit? Sometimes I got like sucked into it somehow, and I remember one time I was at one of I was at the Golgo Bordello show and this woman started like crowd surfing and she was wearing like stiletto heels and one of them poked me right under my eye and literally like part of the heel got lodged in my eye. I had a black line under my eye. I was like a tattoo and was there for like two years. <laughs> wow. What? Oh my God. Was crazy. That gives you more cred than the hoodie with the safety <laughs> pin patch on. I just got to say. <laughs> Yeah, it, had, it looked like eyeliner. It's like a little line. <laughs> but it went away after, like, it was there for a long time. But. Um, I'm curious to know if besides guitar, and I believe you play banjo, are there any other instruments that you play or want to learn how to play? Like, I've been saying this for a while now, but I really want to, like, feel confident on electric guitar, even though it's not, the, like, a different instrument completely, obviously, but... Um, it to me it feels so different and that's one instrument I would really like to get better at but yeah when I go to play it I'm always like oh it sounds so much like an acoustic guitar player just mm. kind of faking it on electric so what do you what do you mean by that like uh what does that sound is it a specific type of playing or I don't know like I use so many open strings I don't feel like I work with the sustain of electric because I'm always on acoustic I'm like playing so many notes that because there's not as much sustain. Um, I don't really know much about like effects. I have some pedals, but I like, I'm not really sure like what they do. <laughs> What's the best piece of guitar advice you've ever received? Well, that reminds me of like this teacher I had at Berkeley who was always giving me like life lessons whenever I'd have like a private lesson with him. Um, and one time he was trying to get me to improvise over like an A chord and play like a B flat note. So like a flat nine. And it was just like making me cringe. Like every time I played it, I was like, oh, it sounds wrong. It sounds wrong. And he was like, finally he made me stop and was like, why does that note sound bad to you or sound weird? I think I kept saying it was weird. And I was like, um, I don't know. Maybe because like I, I'm not used to it. And he was like, so why is like something you're not used to? Why is that weird? And I'm like, oh, I'm just, it sounds different to my ear. I'm like uncomfortable with it. And he was like, that feeling is like the root of all like racism, sexism, like all that, that divides us in the world is related to that root of like, you're not comfortable with this because you're, you don't know it. Um, so that was a really great piece of advice just in general, but also to like, it kind of helped me relax more with new styles of music that like, I remember when I got to Berkeley, I was kind of uncomfortable with jazz. I was like, eh, I don't really like jazz that much. I don't get it. But that helped me kind of just relax and 
feel more receptive to to different styles of music that I hadn't like gotten comfortable with yet. That was like the best answer. <laughs> yeah, thanks again for you know doing this after you took a red eye back home. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for um, just being cool with my slightly delirious state on this podcast. <laughs> The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is brought to you by the team at Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by co-host Jamie Stillway. Our theme song was composed by Adam Promutter and performed for this episode by Jeffrey Pepper Rogers. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is directed and edited by Joey Lusterman. Tanya Gonzalez is our producer. Executive producers are Lizzie Lusterman and Stephanie Campos Dalbroy. If you enjoy listening to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast, please spread the word. Your rating and review on Apple Podcasts helps more guitarists find the show. To support the show, you can visit patreon.com slash acousticguitarplus or check the show notes to get that link and other resources related to this episode. And for everyone who already supports us on Patreon, thank you very, very much. It means a lot. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time on the Acoustic Guitar Podcast.